Star Wars Episode 9 has its first footage, revealed at Star Wars Celebration 2019. This movie aims to cap off the sequel trilogy started by director J.J. Abrams, continued by Ryan Johnson, and then finished again by J.J. Abrams. So let's break down some of the Easter eggs and references relating to the timeline of this new film. Character details, story, what happened between this and The Last Jedi, the director switch and how that changed the story, Carrie Fisher's involvement, Lando, how the hell the Emperor could have returned, what the rise of Skywalker means, and more. Also, potential spoilers for episode nine, because sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm not right. And also, if there's a specific topic that you want to jump to, these are the topics and they are linked in the description. Some interesting information has been revealed about the production of this film. This is all background information about the hirings and firings that happened in the lead up to this. So if you really don't need to know any of these details, feel free to jump ahead to this time code. Now, as you may or may not remember, director Colin Trevorrow left episode nine back in 2017, in what was rumoured to be creative differences. J.J. Abrams was asked to return by Kathleen Kennedy whilst he was in the midst of another project, so his initial response was, no thank you, uh, not ever. But Lucasfilm were like, ah, come on, also money probably. And he was like, ah yeah, alright. The thing is though, with the release date set for December 2019, that two year window was locked in, and essentially, he started from scratch. Abrams has said himself that there was no story, no cast, no designers, no sets, and in the age of the bloody prequels and green screen, that wouldn't have been a problem. Ha ha ha! Got him! There was a crew, but all the work that had been done applied to the Trevorrow version that was binned in its entirety. To help with the project, he needed a co-writer, and so he went with Argo slash Batman v Superman slash Justice League's own Chris Terrio. After the release of The Force Awakens, Abrams has said that he had an idea of where the story would have gone, but with Ryan Johnson taking the helm of The Last Jedi, it went in another direction. So now he has to build a sequel that needs to answer questions not only from his own project, but a second one that he didn't really have a hand in. Plus the finale aims to wrap up all nine saga films in one go. Good luck! Right, so the opening of this trailer has Rey standing against a TIE fighter. Kind of reminiscent of Luke taking on the speeder from Return of the Jedi. A few things of note though are in this scene. Rey has a new outfit. It's white, which probably symbolizes selling a slightly different action figure. But also we get the reforged Skywalker lightsaber. It's a slightly different hill but yeah, that's essentially the same one. I guess instead of building her own, like Luke does to help complete his Jedi training, reforging one, you know, that still counts for something. That TIE fighter with the red highlights might be part of the recently mentioned Red Fury that will feature prominently in the new Galaxy's Edge Disneyland theme park. All we know about this particular group from within the First Order is that they're looking for something. More on what that something might be in a bit, because I want to talk about the pilot. The pilot, I believe, to be Kylo Ren. There was an image released of him in a cockpit, and if you look here, those gloves line up with what he's had in previous movies. Also, the blurred lighting here, that lines up in both images. Okay, so we're getting another desert planet. I'd imagine that this is going to be us revisiting one that already exists. It probably isn't Jeddah from Rogue One. We saw that that again in the comics and it is absolute cactus. That leaves either Tatooine or Jakku. It has some plant life on it that makes me think, yeah, it is Jakku. But still, you know, it's all rocks and sand and honestly, I have no idea. Also, quick thing, the blaster that she has is still the same one that Han Solo gave her in The Force Awakens. And this text here, every generation has a legend, was also used in the very first Phantom Menace trailer. Sweet callback. It's all cyclical. I know I sound sarcastic, but I'm not being sarcastic. I love that trailer. Even if the real Phantom Men has turned out to be that the movie wasn't very good. The narration though in this trailer is again Luke Skywalker, probably force ghosting it up, saying we passed on what we know. 1,000 generations live in you now. Here's the thing though, Luke passed on sweet F.A. He gave Rey two of the three lessons promised. She stole some books unbeknownst to him and then he died. That makes me think we're not only gonna be getting more lessons from Luke from beyond, but also he says we, which also makes me think we'll get at least a couple of other cameos from more dead Jedi. Obi-Wan, Yoda, Anakin, Qui-Gon Jinn, Kit Fiesto. Just a slew of characters Rey has no association with or knowledge of. Unless though Luke's talking to Kylo Ren because you know maybe he turns to the good side or whatever that son of a gun who knows what he's up to. But on Kylo Ren though there's been rumours for a long time that he'd be sporting a reforged helmet. And yeah we're getting that. Weird thing is though that's not him reforging it. That is a very hairy hand and Kylo Ren as we know is shockingly hairless. So maybe it's one of his Knights of Ren? The red crystalline material used to repair it looks like it could also tie in 
with the whole Red Fury thing. This chase though, I believe takes place later in the movie. The planet we see everyone on at the end of the trailer, I believe might actually be the start of the movie, as Ray's outfit is much cleaner. It might even be the forest moon of Endor, for Death Star reasons, which I will be circling back to. Whilst this is going on, I also think this is going on, with Finn, Poe, and C-3PO cruising on some kind of skiff, chased by a new type of stormtrooper. We get one of them on a speeder, and two on jetpacks. Now we haven't seen a jetpack in the Star Wars movie timeline since Boba Fett used his to throw himself into the Sarlacc. Maybe that's because that's the last of the jetpack technology, and it took like 30 years for everyone to catch up again. Speaking of old technology though, we get A-Wings. It seems like this one is flying past a Star Destroyer. Looks like a Clone Wars era ship. You know, it's pretty blurry. Probably isn't. This also looks like it might be an A-Wing, but it also, get this, kind of looks like that ship that left Rey on Jakku. So it could be a connection to her parents. Could this be Jakku at night? Maybe is Kerry Russell's character who hasn't been revealed yet her mother. Sure, why not? Now, if you didn't watch the episode 9 panel, I'm going to save you an hour. Here we go. I mean, it was mostly cheering anyways. So here are the basics. The movie is currently in the editing process along with the visual effects. This is very much going to be a group adventure with everyone teaming up. They also used real sets and locations as much as possible. You know, He's practical, right. not digital. Oh, this isn't the prequels. Finn as a character has found his footing in the resistance along with Ray's staff, it seems. First pose jacket, now Ray's staff. This guy is unbelievable. Also, John Boyega confirmed that Captain Phasma is gone. But I wouldn't bank on that just yet. You never bloody know. It was also a bit vague on the relationship between him and Rose, but apparently we will get emotional closure in relation to love and friendship in his life. Oscar Isaac also said that Han is a better pilot in the Falcon, but Poe is a better pilot all round, and Rey will have learned some Jedi book stuff, which was also confirmed in the comics, which we're going to touch on real soon. There was also a bit in the panel where it was asked, hey, when is this movie set? And in answer to that, there was the firm response of, yeah, some time has passed since the last movie. Though it seems like the information relating to the timeline may have already been revealed. John Boyega has previously confirmed that this movie takes place around a year after the last. It's pretty standard for a Star Wars movie to leave a significant gap in between, The Last Jedi being the exception to this by picking things up straight away. Why the gap though? Well, you know, actors age, you can kind of move the story along, but also you can jam a bunch of extra content in there, some of which we've already seen. Episode 9 should see the return of Black Squadron, a resistant starfighter team led by Poe Dameron introduced in The Force Awakens and yet suspiciously absent in The Last Jedi. Canonically, this is because they're off on their own adventures in the Poe Dameron comic, which also gives us the first look at the universe post nearly everybody in the resistance is killed. One moment we see is Rey beginning to read the ancient Jedi texts. You know, the ones that it seems Luke didn't bother to. Sacred Jedi texts. Ooh. Read them, have you? Well, I, I mean, you know, with passages like The Force is the light, the Force is the dark, Jedi choose the blah blah pfft. Yeah, I get it, I wouldn't have read that. Rose Tico, though, we see that she's still unconscious, with Finn commenting that she's asleep, so that's probably good. But I would argue that she almost certainly has a serious concussion, and being asleep is definitely not good. After the events of The Last Jedi, Black Squadron also gets into trouble, so Poe Dameron begs General Leia to allow him to help. But she's like, nah, man, everyone who's in the resistance, you know, they're mostly on the ship, so no. And he's like, oh, come on. And then she's like, ah, yeah, fine. So he does a rescue. I mean, but who's even left in the resistance? Because as mentioned, most are dead. But we do have Black Squadron featuring Jess Parva, Kare Khan, Snap Wexley. That's old bloody Greg Granny Grumberg, childhood friend of J.J. Abrams and also his good luck charm. Poe Dameron and this blue-skinned, acid-spitting nightmare of a character. Then, of course, we got Rose Tico, Finn. Ray, droids, Chewbacca, Connix, played by Billy Lord, Carrie Fisher's daughter. Nyan Num, he's back, he blew up the second Death Star with Lando. Various others, who cares? And of course, General Leia. The big news last year though, was that Carrie Fisher will return for what will probably be the last time as General Leia. And the idea is not to recreate her using CGI, like with the Tarkin Valley. I mean, the Nightmare Valley. I mean, the uncanny Tarkin Nightmare Valley. You know what, it's actually really good. I shouldn't kick it. This really is a marvel of special effects. But still, when I look at it, my brain is like, and fire. I think it genuinely fires up my fight or flight response. Anyway, that's neither here nor there because what they're doing is going with unused footage from both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Todd Fisher, her brother, was quoted as saying, there's a lot of minutes of footage. I don't just mean outtakes. This is unused. New content that could be woven into the storyline. That's what's going to give everyone such a great kick. It's going to look like it's meant to be, like it was shot yesterday. One moment I'd imagine there's a fair chance it'll make the cut is this deleted scene from The Force Awakens trailer 
This has Maz Kanata handing General Leia the Skywalker lightsaber. The dialogue from this scene is currently unknown, though I'd imagine this could be repurposed, so it could relate to the reforged lightsaber. And really, you could just swap out Maz Kanata, who's a CGI character, for Rey or Finn or Dooku, anyone really. From the footage we get in the trailer, it looks like this could be repurposed stuff from Rey hugging Leia after Han's death. I mean, you know, it's easy enough to swap out a background. I mean, I say that, but really it'd be a long and complicated process, a mostly thankless job of the special effects department. This moment here looks to be Leia looking at the medal she gave Han in A New Hope. Or maybe it's Luke's medal, but you know, it's probably Han's. This is most likely new footage that was shot and someone else's hands. I tried to match up Carrie Fisher's hands from The Last Jedi with these hands, but I came to the realization that I don't know, all hands look the same to me, man, unless they got hair on them. I, I, I don't know. Also, though, nice touch in the trailer with the adding of the Princess Leia theme. Another sweet callback. Some confirmed new characters, though, include this guy. Clad. Clod? Clad? Apparently a contact of Chewie. How'd he contact him, though? What'd he pick up the phone with? Doesn't, doesn't have any arms. Get some arms, mate! Plus, we got Naomi Aki's Jana, who Oscar Isaac said in an interview after the panel that her first day on set, she had to do this really badass thing in front of everybody, and she crushed it. Also, she was asked directly if she's Lando's daughter, and she was like, yeah, Lando's probably got a bunch of kids around the galaxy, so, you know, maybe. BB-8 also has a new piece of merchandise. I mean toy, I mean friend, in Dio. This particular version was built specifically for Star Wars Celebration. Then, of course, we have Lando, and the return of 82-year-old Billy D. Williams. I think because of the backlash of the deaths of two major original trilogy characters, coupled with the real-life death of Carrie Fisher means that Lando is probably safe from death in this film. You know, he'll coast through, shielded by the ever-present shadow of Star Wars fan protection and the fury that they are capable of. But I say, that's unfair. If Han's dead, and Luke's dead, plus Leia can't be in any more movies after this, and most importantly of all, Admiral Akbar is gone, then I say, hashtag death for Lando. Get him out of here, Lucasfilm. What are you, a bunch of cowards? He deserves an untimely departure the same way that everybody else does. Lando's outfit, though, is very reminiscent of what we got him in in Soul a Star Wars bomb. I mean, story. Also, he's back behind the wheel of the Falcon. He finally got to reclaim his ship. Maybe he could, you know, get it detailed because Han Solo turned it into a nightmare of grime and bacteria. He's a very gross man. Also, interesting tidbit, the Falcon has its round dish again. Because if you recall, originally it did have a round dish. Then Lando knocked it off at the second Death Star. Wait, is this the second Death Star? Are they going to retrieve the circular dish? We'll talk about it soon. But then when the Falcon shows up in The Force Awakens, it has a rectangular dish. And I only just realized this going back. It actually gets shot off on crate. So welcome back, circular dish. Now people can get their original Millennium Falcon toys out of the bin, but not, of course, before destroying their new one. What could the title The Rise of Skywalker possibly mean, though? Could they retcon Rey to be a Skywalker? That is entirely possible, but it's also been hinted at that J.J. Abrams won't be doing any of that. But also he said that it wasn't Khan, and it was Khan, and in Lost they weren't supposed to be in purgatory, and then at the end they were in purgatory. I don't know, I stopped paying attention. But what it could indicate is redemption for Kylo Ren. And with that though, I feel like, you know, he's kind of had his chance. Multiple chances. And he's just been a dog of a bloke at every opportunity. Of course, it could also mean the return of Luke Skywalker back from death. He was actually cloned in the old continuity from his severed hand. And that gave us evil Luke to use. I won't get into it. I think I made a video on it. So maybe he'll just, I don't know, flat out return from the dead through the force. That, however, seems unlikely and goes against the sacrifice he made in The Last Jedi. So maybe it's the return of Anakin and Skywalker, but again, that would involve cloning or being back from the dead. I don't know, perhaps it's just like a metaphor, like the rise of Skywalker, but like, you know, it's symbolic of, of something else. Like, love and the force. Look, I don't know, right? What do you want? Speaking of things returning though, the Death Star is back. Good to see you, the Death Star. I haven't seen a Death Star in a saga movie since like, one movie ago. Which Death Star is it though? Number one or number two? The dish I think resembles more closely to the first, though it is tilted at an angle so it's kind of hard to tell. If I had to hazard a guess though, I would say it's the second. For one, it ties more to the Emperor. And also there was an unused idea from The Force Awakens that had the Falcon visiting it underwater. And in other concept art, we got an early version of Rey scuba diving for something within the Emperor's tower. Maybe the Falcon dish is what I'm saying. There's a couple of videos on my channel that deal with the rejected concepts from the sequel trilogy. There's some really interesting stuff in there. I'll link it at the end of below if you want to check it out. Whatever it is, though, it most likely ties into the return of the Emperor. And speaking of, Ian McDermott is back as Palpatine in some capacity. That very much sounds like a new recording of his laugh also. 
But here's the thing. George Lucas at one point clearly outlined that the Sith cannot return from the dead, and that's why they're obsessed with prolonging life. They're terrified of the infinite black, as we all are, or at the very least I am. However, in the past, dark side spirits have been tied in some limited capacity to an item that allows them to be resurrected. So really, George Lucas' original thoughts, they're kind of out the window at this point. The Emperor, though, he has been cloned before, so it could be that. In Legends, after Darth Vader pitched him into the center of the Death Star, his spirit found its way into one of his many cloned bodies. But I don't think that's the direction they're going to go with. His spirit could also live on in some form. Maybe it inhabits the second Death Star somehow. Also, Star Wars Rebels recently introduced time travel with the world between worlds. Palpatine seemed to spend a fair chunk of his life trying to access it so he could manipulate galaxy-wide events, you know, like across time. So it could be that. But another option is, after his death in canon, we saw in Battlefront 2, the video game, he executed Operation Cinder, which involved destroying everything, like the Empire, the Rebels, all of it. Basically the equivalent of a child taking his bat and ball and going home. And he actually put out these orders through a series of spooky droids. But if I had to take a run at it, you know, make a guess at how he'll actually return. I think that it's not really him. That it's either another contingency plan that kicks into effect making the galaxy believe that he's still alive, or you know that he's somehow returned from the dead. This could be done again through automated droids, but to take it one step further, there is the possibility that this is a Palpatine impersonator. With Snoke gone and Kylo Ren in charge, we're kind of lacking in a big bad, and someone took this opportunity to fill the void. There was actually an idea to include a Vader impersonator in episode 7, something I also said in a video of mine like years ago that might be an interesting idea to put in The Force Awakens. Coincidence? I mean, yeah, definitely. Nobody at Lucasfilm would listen to this. Why would they? But maybe like using that submerged Death Star idea, we're going to be getting an old concept recycled and tweaked. Grand Admiral Thrawn, he was actually killed in Legends, and then an actor took his place long after his death. It's like an old Star Wars idea. And to tie into that also, we're supposed to be getting some kind of Knights of Ren something in this, you know, like Kylo Ren's mates. So maybe it's one of them doing it. Matt Smith is supposed to be in this movie, but we've heard virtually nothing about his character. So it could be like a Wizard of Oz man behind the curtain situation. It's really easy in the Star Wars universe to fake a hologram phone call. As we've seen the Emperor himself use this technology to make himself appear younger and less like a hideous monster. This video is getting pretty long, so all these theories I'll probably flesh out in a later video. You know how it is. You don't want to be here all day. And neither do I, quite frankly. Who knows how this whole thing is going to wrap up, and really how, as of yet, it's going to be received. J.J. Abrams, though, seems extremely happy about how it's turning out. In a recent interview stating, now that I'm back, the difference is I feel like we might have done it. Like I actually feel like this crazy challenge that could have been a wildly uncomfortable contortion of ideas and a kind of shoving in of answers and band-aids and bridges and things that would have felt messy. Without jinxing anything or sounding more confident than I deserve to be, I feel like we're in a place where we might have something incredibly special. I mean, look, he's hardly gonna say, yeah, nah, we botched it. I don't know what I'm doing. But this kind of confidence means at the very least, you know, he's happy with it, and that surely means something. Question though, anything else from this trailer of note worth discussing, like an idea or a theory? If so, please leave it below, as I'll probably make a follow-up video very soon based on some of these ideas. And as about this, this is a multi-pronged question, so please, pay attention. That's YouTube, you don't have to. But look, it starts like this. Did you like The Last Jedi? If you answer yes, do you think this will be an improvement and a satisfying conclusion to the sequel trilogy? If no, do you think J.J. Abrams could restore your faith in the sequel trilogy? And hey, there's always Star Wars now and forever, so I'll probably always be covering it. So subscribe if you want to. Also this Monday morning on my podcast, The Weekly Planet, where we talk movies and comics and TV shows, we're getting stuck into not only this new footage, but all the big news coming out of Star Wars Celebration. The films, the TV shows, video games, books, comics. It's linked below. Like I said, it's called The Weekly Planet and it's available on a separate YouTube channel, plus iTunes, Spotify, multiple platforms. Just Google it, you'll find it. But really, thanks for watching this. I genuinely appreciate it. Take care.